Good afternoon, welcome, and salamu alaikum. My name is Ruba Kanaan, and I'm the head of education and scholarly programs here at the Aga Khan Museum, and the organizer of the lecture series that we are launching here today. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you for what I know will be an insightful and exciting beginning to the museum's first annual lecture series, this year on the theme of Islam and Muslims in the 21st century. I also bring to you the greetings of Henry Kim, the museum's director and CEO, who is abroad and will not be able to join us today. Since opening its doors to the public in September of 2014, really a yearly, uh, only a year and a half ago, the museum shared with its visitors our exceptional art collection, a collection that reflects the journeys of Muslim civilizations throughout history their diverse expressions of art, literature, science, and knowledge, and the multitude of their encounters and engagements with other cultures and civilizations. In addition, we presented exhibitions, lectures, school programs, art workshops, and performances that demonstrate the richness and diversity of Muslim civilizations and how contemporary artists engage with traditions. With this new lecture series, we're expanding the space of engagement and conversation. We are providing a context for the Aga Khan Museum collection and fulfilling our mission as identified by the museum's founder and chairman of the board, His Highness the Aga Khan. A mission to create a better understanding and knowledge and encourage enlightened conversation. Thus, demystifying Islam and Muslims and defying the loud voice of a violent minority that seeks a world divided, a voice that unfortunately occupies much of the airwaves these days. This series contributes to presenting the diverse views, opinions, and experiences that exist among Muslims in the past and today in the 21st century. I want to bring to your attention that on your way out, there's this card that has the full range of the series, of the six lectures involved in this series. And I do encourage you to sort of take a close look. And I would say, book tickets because they're flying. And it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to us to see that there's so much reception for such an important conversation. Before I hand the podium over to David Wonsley, the Globe and, Globe and Mail's Editor-in-Chief, I'd like to acknowledge the many organizations and institutions that were instrumental in supporting the lecture series in many different ways. First, I would like to thank our media sponsor, the Globe and Mail, and thank its Editor-in-Chief, David Wonsley, who will be taking the podium in a minute to introduce Harun Siddiqui this afternoon. We are also very grateful to the support for the support of Massey College at the University of Toronto. In addition to sponsoring the series, Massey College is generously providing the refreshments that you will enjoy at the close of the lecture today, and in fact, all the lectures in our series. The post-lecture reception provide an opportunity to continue the dialogue started here by our speakers. And we're especially excited to acknowledge a host of community partners, like-minded organizations and institutions who share the spirit of inquiry, engagement, and debate that this new lecture series embodies. And they are, in alphabetical order, Canadian Arab Institute, Institute for Canadian Citizenship, Kiwanis Toronto, Noor Cultural Center, Paria Trillium Foundation, Ryerson University's uh, Middle East and North Africa Studies Center, and the Tessellate Institute. Having the support of our sponsors and our community partners is so important to the Aga Khan Museum. It makes events like this possible. And it helps to further the kinds of conversations that should be taking place in the world today. Conversations that lead to greater mutual understanding 
please join me in expressing appreciation to all of them. I now invite David Walmsley, the Globe and Mail's Editors-in-Chief, to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanan. It is a real pleasure and honor on behalf of the Globe and Mail to sponsor this inaugural series. Six very special lectures on a complex and important topic. And it is uh, our delight to be connected so closely to the Aga Khan Museum. The square mile around this area is truly a place of tranquility and a place for thoughtfulness. It gives us all an opportunity to pause, to think, and to consider. And surely there is nothing more challenging today than looking at the issue of Islam, Muslims in the 21st century. But of course the media has its role to play, and too often in the binary nature of good and bad, villainous and ideal, the media can fall into caricature. And so we need to do a better job. And so with that act, in a way of better understanding, it is uh, somewhat eccentric that the Global Mail editor is introducing Arun Siddiqui of the Toronto Star. <laughs> Haroon, in some ways, needs no introduction. He came to Canada in the late 60s. He was inspired by Expo in Montreal. And then he got to work selling menswear at Simpsons. But he decided that wasn't for him. And he made a call to the then editor of the Globe and Mail, Clark Davy, to find a job. And that job was in Brandon, Manitoba, where he spent a pretty happy 10 years working for the Brandon Sun. He then moved to Toronto 37 years ago and started his illustrious career with the Toronto Star, ultimately ending up as editorial page emeritus, and now, although fully retired, writing a book and giving lectures. He's also been a former past president of Penn Canada and on the international board of Penn International, an incredibly vital organization in 109 countries. Haroon has spent his lifetime in journalism understanding people, be it the marginalized, be it immigrants, be it women, be it visible minorities, and certainly since 9-11, Muslims. It is my great pleasure to welcome Haroon to the stage where he will take on the challenge and I think teach us all a few things about the role of the media and Muslims in the 21st century. Thank you, Ruba. Thank you, David. The Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, John Rolson Saul, Premier Wynn, Jane Rantwait, Justice Russell Jurians, Chief Justice Strathy, John Honrick, Chairman of the Board of the Toronto Star Corporation, my employer for a long time, uh, friends and colleagues. Thank you all for coming, especially on what has turned out to be a glorious spring day. And thank you for battling the traffic today. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to come here because, as you know, the Akhan Museum and Park have been an absolutely stunning addition to Toronto's architectural and cultural landscape. This jewel is a pride and joy, not only for Ismaili Muslims, but for all of us, for all Canadians. I'm so enamored of this space that I've asked that we all be shown a little video of it, cutting into my time. And I'm not doing it to thank the sponsor, but because I really love this place and I want you to see it. Can we show the video, please? It took 14 years to plan and four years to build. Now Toronto's Aga Khan Museum is ready to open its doors. This striking building will be home to a significant collection of Islamic art and cultural artefacts. 
Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper was joined on an opening tour by His Highness the Aga Khan, founder and chairman of the Aga Khan Development Network and spiritual leader of the world's Ismaili community. The permanent exhibits were collected over many years by him and his family. His brother, Prince Amin, explained their vision for the museum, the only one of its kind in North America. Here, in Toronto, visitors from all over the world will be uniquely able to experience and appreciate the intellectual, cultural and artistic heritage of Muslim civilizations in all of its rich diversity. It is my hope and expectation that this museum will play an active and effective educational role, helping visitors to appreciate, understand and empathize with an aesthetic and a culture new but no longer foreign or alien to them. Furthermore, the museum should endeavor to institute creative outreach activities into the schools and other educational institutions in this area. In its educational focus, the museum will reach out to speak to Muslims and non-Muslims alike about the peace, creativity, beauty and pluralism of Muslim history. And in these tumultuous times, those values are needed more than ever. As the museum took shape, His Highness the Aga Khan and Prince Amin worked to build a permanent collection drawn from every region and period and every kind of material in the Muslim world. The aim is to grow that collection for generations to come. From Iran, this thousand-year-old canon of medicine was the work of Ibn Sina, known in the West as Avicenna. For five centuries, it was the most important medical reference book in Europe and the Middle East. Some of the treatments it records are still in use. From India, these watercolour illustrations are from the manuscript of Babur Nama. They were made in the 16th century by artists Kanha and Iklas. This Mongol-style robe is remarkably preserved for a garment woven more than 700 years ago. Ceramics from throughout the Muslim world share space with rare items of metalwork and fine carpets which would have been a lifetime's work for their creators. One of the most fascinating exhibits is this astrolabe. Made in Spain, it was an early aid to celestial navigation. Fantastic piece of art, fantastic piece of scientific instrument, which is effectively one of the earliest computers. But what's remarkable about this object is that it has inscribed on it inscriptions in both Arabic and Latin, which shows you Christians and Muslims living side by side in Spain in the 14th century. It also has scratched on it inscriptions in Hebrew. Visitors will enjoy this video display of some of the thousand artifacts on show. And some may be surprised by the richness of a culture which spans 11 centuries and three continents, from the Iberian Peninsula and West Africa to China. For me, the mission of this museum is to change people's perceptions. It may happen tomorrow, it may take a generation to, to, to occur. But what's most important when you look at the impact of this museum is that people do appreciate the art and creativity of the Muslim world and they also see it as part of world heritage. That's what this museum is all about. The Aga Khan Museum promises far more than static displays of ancient treasures. This will be a center for the performing arts with frequent dance and music events. Contemporary art will also have a place, beginning with an exhibition of work by artists from Pakistan. It includes this colourful piece, which at first appears to be a rug. Closer inspection reveals it's made from more than a million gold pins. We'll be opening up to five exhibitions a year, actually, in the spaces that you're in now. They'll be of international content, they'll range from historical to contemporary work, and we'll be also using uh, the gardens to exhibit art. So this will be a very, very lively place from an exhibition point of view. The design of the museum itself presented a challenge. The site is surrounded by undistinguished city blocks, so a structure of architectural merit could not be expected to blend with its surroundings. The solution was to set the building in a park with reflecting pools and flower beds. 
we had thought that the site needed a civic space, uh, which will be a gift to Toronto, uh, and a landscape park, which uh, immediately uh, His Highness uh, actually shared that vision. So the buildings became secondary uh, to the park, and that's how we've uh, uh, conceived the site at the very beginning. The museum itself is a very simple rectilinear building to create a very bold statement, but its uniqueness is given through the way the building is chiseled, it's been angulated uh, from the exterior, and that had been informed from the theme of light because it's a self-shading building. Uh, the upper part of the building cantilevers two meters out from the base. When the sun is out, uh, the building begins to cast shadows on itself, and you can only do that when you have an angled facade. So uh, the theme of light had informed that chisel and the material itself, the white granite, is informed uh, and hopefully responds to the celebration of light. Toronto is a city of diverse communities and a vibrant centre of culture. But those were not the only factors that brought the museum here. As the director of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture explained to journalists, the location made perfect sense. If we establish a radius around Toronto, of one hour distance flight, you have 60 to 70 million people living in that circle, and those are the potential immediate public of the museum. No forecast has been given of how many people will visit the Aga Khan Museum, but figures are seen as less important than the statement it makes. At a time when some view the Muslim world in a negative light, this remarkable collection pays tribute to the beauty of a culture which has graced the world for more than 1,400 years. The history of the thought and the creations of man can perhaps be said to be a long path from one period of enlightenment to another. I would hope that this museum will contribute to a new period of enlightenment, helping visitors from around the world to rediscover the common symbols that unite us all across the globe, across all civilizations, across time. This topic, media, Muslims, and free speech, is really fraught with landmines. Landmines of highly contested ideologies, geopolitical and cultural fault lines of the age that we live in, as well as much debated media methodologies that David referred to. Let's start with the contemporary geopolitical context. The media are operating in the age of Muslim terrorism. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Boko Haram, and Daesh, also known as ISIS, all of whom inflict unspeakable horrors, beheading people, kidnapping girls, and blowing up civilians, including many Muslims. Second, there is the seemingly endless war on terrorism, and we now have more terrorism than before we launched the war on terrorism. Wars on Muslim nations or Muslims in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, and other places. Wars that have killed or led to the killing of one million Muslims in 15 years. A million Muslims dead in 15 years. Wars make the media, or much of the media, cheerleaders for their troops. That's what the American media did in the early years of the Vietnam War. That's what they did for, for, for too long in the Iraq war. That's what the Canadian media did with our military mission in Afghanistan, especially with journalists embedded with our troops. Embedded journalism is valid because it provides a closer view of what our troops are doing. 
but it can and often does obscure the democratic debate that is essential about such wars. It is also useful to remember that much of the mainstream media in Canada editorially endorsed both the war in Afghanistan and also the war in Iraq. Canadians, on the other hand, were skeptical about the first and were deeply opposed to the second. We also know that wars need propaganda. Propaganda to keep public opinion at home on side. So wars are waged as much in the media as on the battlefields. Propaganda includes outright lies, such as the presence of the non-existent WMDs in Iraq. It includes soft tactics, such as Laura Bush and Sherry Blair becoming the chief cheerleaders of the war in Afghanistan by championing the cause of Afghan women. Afghan women do need liberating, but we didn't invade Afghanistan to liberate them. While our leaders repeatedly and often proclaim that they are waging wars on terrorists, not on Muslims, let alone Islam, it is not easy to separate out the Muslims over there from the Muslims here. So it was inevitable that the propaganda to justify wars on Muslim nations has deteriorated into cultural warfare on Muslims often waged in the media. The confusion or deliberate conflation of Muslim terrorists there and ordinary Muslims here leads to the laying of collective guilt on all Muslims. What do you, Siddiqui, have to say about this or that latest terrorist act of terrorism? I am personally responsible for it. <laughs> so Muslims are suspected of being fifth columnists. That's what the Japanese Canadians were suspected of during the Second World War. Of course, Muslims today are not being interned. We live in a different age. But many Muslims complain of being psychologically interned, of being under surveillance and suspicion, and of being under siege. Next, of course, there is the all-important raging debate about terrorism waged by Muslims in the name of jihad. Is it the result of Western wars and Muslims? Or is terrorism slash jihadism an integral part of the Islamic ethos? If Islam is a violent religion, as is often alleged, what explains the fact that the phenomenon of Muslim terrorism as we know it today has only exploded in the last 25 years? Also, the first generation of Muslim immigrants to the West were not terrorists. It's only the second generation, born and raised here, highly assimilated in the language, education, and pop culture of the West, who are becoming jihadists. Elizabeth Manning Buller, the former head of M15 in Great Britain, has said, quote, our involvement in Iraq has radicalized a whole generation of young people, unquote. Just about the same message is given by CSIS and FBI and the other security forces to their leaders. But we are not supposed to probe this link. To question this is to be almost a terrorist yourself, as the British author Tariq Ali has written. All of this, however, does not explain the terrorism of Boko Haram and the others who are inflicting great horrors in lands that have had nothing to do with American and other invasions. So the debate rages on. There is also 
the unprecedented rise of xenophobia and nativism in Europe and the United States. And it gets played out in our media every day. Islamophobia is the new anti-Semitism. Racists and bigots have cleverly traded their anti-Semitism for anti-Muslim hostility. Familiar anti-Jewish tropes are now applied to Muslims. Islam is incompatible with secularism, just as Judaism was said to be. Muslims cannot be trusted, just as Jews could not be. Muslims are going to take over, just as Jews were and still are accused of taking over the world. Unfortunately, Islamophobia is not confined to right-wingers. Many of the so-called smaller liberals, including many in the media, say and write things about Muslims and Islam that they never would about any other people or any other faith. So newer ways are being found to insult, humiliate, and demean Muslims and Islam. Burning the Quran, insulting the Prophet Muhammad, introducing pork into school menus in France, attacking the niqab, even the hijab. The list is long. For a very long time, I had thought that Canada would be immune to such ugliness. So while Canada has not turned anti-immigrant, many Canadians have indeed turned against Muslims. Quebec had a nasty debate over the so-called reasonable accommodation. In 2012, it introduced the Charter of Quebec Values, which proposed to ban all religious attire and symbols, but its real target were Muslims, as the PQ made abundantly clear. While Pauline Marois was doing it in the name of secularism, Stephen Harper was targeting Muslims in the name of national security. The next point in the series is that the fear of Muslim terrorism and fear of Muslims has been so hyped up, the public has taught, lost touch with reality. Two people in Canada and a total of 45 people in the United States have been killed by terrorists since 9-11. About 14,000 Americans are killed by guns every year. 30,000 people die in automobile accidents. And as President Obama is said to remind his staff, hundreds die by falling in their bathtub. The FBI, for example, notes that the main terrorist threat to the United States comes not from Muslim extremists, but right-wing, white, Christian extremists. CSIS says about the same thing without minimizing the danger posed by jihadists. The next reality is that we are more concerned about the victims of terrorism in the West than we are about the far more numerous Muslim victims of terrorism in Muslim nations. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, Nigeria, and elsewhere. This formulation is parochial and it is understandable. We care for our own. But what it says is that our society sheds tears for the white victims of terrorism, but not for its brown and black victims. So jumbo headlines for the murders in Paris and Brussels but hardly any for the mass murders in Kabul, Karachi, and Baghdad. Such double standards were fine when the world was isolated. They over there cared for their own, and we here in the West cared for ours. But in this globalized world, especially the global village called Canada, this formulation is increasingly jarring. Among other things, it undermines media credibility with many Canadians. 
What that also tells us is a great sociological fact. Canadians are making this transition from parochial to global more rapidly than are our media. Something to think about. The other glaring double standard is on free speech. It seems that we must be free to malign Muslims, but Muslims must not claim the right to be free from hate speech, which is also a very Canadian value. Free speech is not absolute, regardless of what we are being told every day. It is not an unfettered right. My right to swing my arm stops at your cheek. It is some circumscribed by laws of libel, laws of hate, and most important, by self-restraint, which is why we no longer caricature Aboriginal peoples in cartoons or draw cartoons of savage-looking blacks or hook-nosed Jews or cross-eyed Chinese. But some people not only want to draw caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, but insist that it is their duty to do so. Thus the Danish cartoons, thus the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Yet others feel it is perfectly all right in this day and age to attribute collective characteristics to Muslims the way we used to against our Aboriginal peoples or African Canadians. Thus Maclean's magazine and the infamous 4,800 word piece published in 2006, saying that too many Muslims are prone to violence and pose an existentialist threat to the West, including Canada. Unlike the United States, which has little or no restraint on free speech, Canada and several European nations do maintain anti-hate laws, which is why we had Section 13 of the Federal Human Rights Code, which prohibited exposing a person or a people to hatred or contempt. And various provincial human rights codes also have similar provisions. Inconsistent, but they are there. But in 2012, the Harper government acts the anti-hate provision of the Canadian Human Rights Act. It did so at the behest of most of those people who supported Maclean's and wanted the right to say whatever they wished. Ironically, within a year of Harper axing Section 13, the Supreme Court of Canada found that section to be valid. Ruling in an earlier case involving homophobic preaching by a right-wing Christian, the court said unanimously that unfettered speech does not help public debate. Rather than advancing dialogue, the court said, and I quote, hate speech is antithetical to this objective in that it shuts down dialogue by making it difficult or impossible for members of the vulnerable groups to respond, thereby stifling discourse, unquote. The media which have traditionally campaigned for more freedom were also campaigning for the elimination of Section 13. So they, in effect, joined the Islamophobes, but for different reasons, obviously. Still, in my opinion, they should have found the time and the inclination to address the issue of how to protect a weak minority from discrimination and hate speech, which is also a very Canadian value, as I said. The Muslim world had a totally different reaction to all the attacks on the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. Many Muslim nations launched a misguided campaign to place restrictions on expressions considered offensive or defamatory to religions. We at Penn Canada and Penn International strongly opposed the move led by John Ralston Saul, who was then president of International Penn. I can add here that these Muslim nations were being highly hypocritical because many of them don't have free speech and in fact control and censor their media. 
In doing so, they are in fact violating the spirit of the Quran. According to Muslim tradition, the first revealed word from God to the Prophet Muhammad was, read. Iqra' bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. And the second verse also begins with read. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram allazi yallama bil-qalam. What does that say? It says, read in the name of the Lord who created you from a cell. Read in the name of the Lord who gave you the power of the pen. So the very first injunction from God to believers is not about the greatness of God, not the greatness of the Prophet Muhammad, not the greatness of Islam, but rather a simple but profound exhortation to read and write, acquire and spread knowledge. Yet ironically, in many Muslim nations, there is neither the full freedom to read nor write. All of these issues that I've outlined are highly contentious. And people of good faith can agree to disagree. The more relevant point is that the media have been thick in the middle of all of these debates, reporting on them, commenting on them, as is their right. So let's not make the mistake of shooting the messenger. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Let's also re-familiarize ourselves with how the mass media operate. Regardless of what some of you may think, media are not in the business of doing public relations for Muslims or any other group. Just as they're not in the business of doing PR for governments or for politicians. Just ask Premier Win. <laughs> she dreads in the morning to read the headlines. Media cater to the masses, not the intelligentsia. On our bad days, we stoop to the lowest common denominator. On our good days, we aim for the highest common factor. We often follow public opinion, rarely lead it. We traffic in cliches and stereotypes. We are always looking for the unusual. We are looking for the two-headed toad every day. We thrive on conflict. But you are not blameless either. If David Wamsley here, or Michael Cook, editor-in-chief of The Star, who is here, if they put out a front page tomorrow that said something like, 35 million Canadians had a very good day yesterday, <laughs> none of you would read it. So don't blame them. Keeping all this in mind, what can we say about the media and Muslims more directly? First, that the media have discovered that Islamophobia sells. The biggest bestsellers in books for the last 15 years have been anti-Islamic books across Europe, across the United States, even in Canada. Just as Islamophobia works for Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, and it did for Mr. Harper for a while, it works for newspapers and radio and TV as well. Muslim bashing has, in fact, become a mini business model, for example, used by Fox TV, and copied in varying degrees by the popular press in Canada and some of the electronic media as well. The popular press especially fans fear and hysteria about terrorism and Muslims. You would recall that during the 2007-2008 Bouchard Taylor Commission on Reasonable Accommodation in Quebec, it concluded that the tabloid press and some of the radio and television stations in Montreal were partly responsible for the so-called reasonable accommodation crisis. So the commission actually hired its own reporters and researchers to check out some of these stories. 
And it found that in almost all of these cases, those stories bore little or no resemblance to facts. The media had created a crisis where none existed. This is not me talking. This is the Bushal Taylor Commission conclusions. In English Canada, the National Post and the Post Media Group of newspapers across the country, which now includes the Sun chain of tabloid newspapers, is very relevant to this discussion. Hardly a week goes by without these publications finding something or the other wrong with Muslims and Islam. They are ever, forever looking for terrorists under every Canadian minaret. They are hunting for an Imam or any Muslim who would make some stupid, outra outrageous statement that they can splash for proof of the rampant Muslim militancy or malevolence. So in the 1950s, you know, we had the Red Scare. The post media are giving you the Green Scare today. Some of the more outrageous allegations against Muslims have been carried on in editorial and opinion pages, especially in the post media publications. People, of course, are free and entitled to their views in a free democratic society, which in fact needs more debate. But even opinion pieces must adhere to the facts. So is it really true that Canadian imams are inciting terrorism? Are our mosques really crawling with potential terrorists? Is a preference for halal products really a sign of fundamentalism? Or worse, militancy? More than it may be for my preference or your preference for kosher foods? This is standard fare on many of our news, uh, opinion pages in the post-media chain of newspapers. So in this context, the concentration of ownership of so many newspapers in the hands of post media has been very bad for Muslims in both news coverage as well as in commentary. Those Canadians who read only the National Post or the Toronto Sun or in other cities where they have no choice but to read only the post media newspapers in Saskatoon, Regina, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and English Montreal, those readers would have an opinion of Muslims that would be totally different from people reading, for example, the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star. This is the same country we live in. Last week, I asked John Hondrick if he thinks there has been an anti-Muslim bias in the media. Yes, there is, he said mostly in the post-media group of newspapers. And he added that some of their columnists conflate Muslim terrorists and Muslims. Quote, this has been lethal, unquote. John Cruikshank, publisher of the Toronto Star, told me on Thursday that a big segment of the Canadian media has been peddling flat out racism, he said, and bigotry against Canadian Muslims. The propaganda machine against Muslims has been, in his words, profoundly awful. And he added this. The popular press perhaps are doing what they're doing, not out of some deep conviction or ideological basis, but because they're playing to the notion of building the loyalty of a certain segment of the population by creating a tribal by creating a tribal solidarity against Muslims. They are doing it to strengthen their own brand. It is despicable, unquote. He added, we have to call them out on it. We have a duty to call out fellow journalists who are not abiding by the rules of their craft. We have to be watchdogs on ourselves, unquote. This is John Cruikshank. Even the so-called 
sophisticated newspapers and major television stations depict Muslims as a monolith. But Canada's 1.1 million Muslims, according to the 2011 census, which may be now 1.3 million, are as diverse as Canada itself. First, they are not fresh off the boat, as often portrayed. Muslim presence in Canada dates back to Confederation. The 1871 census recorded 13 Canadian Muslims. The first Canadian mosque was built in Edmonton in 1938. The ceremony was emceed by a Christian. That mosque is now a museum in Fort Edmonton Park. Canadian Muslims are highly diverse by country of origin, language, culture, ethnicity, and race. Nearly a third, 300,000 of them, are Canadian born. Muslims constitute the youngest demographic in Canada, next only to the Aboriginal peoples. Proportionately, more Muslims are entering the labor force than anyone else. This is an asset to the economy. These young Muslims will pay for your pension and mine, and our Medicare. Muslims are also second only to Jewish Canadians as the most educated of minorities, with 17% of them having finished 18 years or more of education. Yet Muslims earn 27% less than other people and are disproportionately underemployed or unemployed. The media have had little or nothing to say about this subject. One other big shortcoming of the media has been that they always talk about Muslims, but they rarely talk to Muslims. The only Muslims they talk to are the same half a dozen people that Stephen Harper used to talk to, <laughs> who have made a career out of attacking other Muslims and Islam. This has been a growing cottage industry in this country. But the conservatives, were imitating the well-known colonial tactics of the French in Algeria and the British in India of cultivating a handful of pliant Muslims to do their bidding. It has been a feature, actually, of Western colonial or neo-colonial relations with the Muslim world that the Muslim leaders most liked by the West were often the one most disliked by Muslims. Namely, the Shah of Iran. Namely, Anwar Sadat and Husni Mubarak of Egypt. Autocrats, despots, all of them. And here is the punchline. This is for Mikey and David. So what does this tell us about the Canadian media? That the Muslim commentators and pundits that they most quote and patronize are often the one most mistrusted, mistrusted by Muslims. I mean, there's a dissonance here. I have bad news for journalists. The credibility of the media with Muslims is very low. Muslims generally don't trust us. In fact, they're outright afraid of us. They don't think they would get a fair shake from us. They're petrified that their words would be twisted and distorted if the media doesn't find the cliches and stereotypes that they're looking for. Which brings me to the last big topic, which is let's talk about Islamophobia and the media. We all know that Muslims are being harassed, women in particular. They're being spat upon, shoved, punched, and kicked in public spaces across the country. Some have had their hijabs pulled off their heads. Mosques and Muslim schools have been firebombed, ransacked, vandalized, and disfigured with graffiti. In 2014, Statistics Canada reported an increase in hate crimes against Muslims, the only community against which hate crimes had increased. And the most ironic thing about that was the following. At a time when most Canadians, including the media, ostensibly worry about the rights of Muslim women, 
the biggest target of hate were Muslim women. One can argue, rightly so, that you know that this bout of bigotry is more or less of the same variety that other minorities have faced in this country before. This implies that we should just accept it and wait for it to blow over, which it no doubt will at some point, this being Canada. That absolves the media of any responsibility. After all, in the past, the media did go along with the bigotry of that time, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, and racism against blacks and Asians, and of course, against the Aboriginal peoples. Can today's media do no better? Is that what we are saying? Don't we claim a moral component to our mission? that of telling the truth, strengthening democracy, promoting civil liberty, advancing peace and harmony, and standing up for the weak and the vulnerable. Have we lived up to this mission in the case of Muslims? That's an internal debate that we need to have. Not all is disheartening about Canada or the media. I do wish to acknowledge that the media have improved a great deal in recent years. There was, of course, the Little Mosque and the Prairies, the most spectacularly successful show the CBC has ever put on. <laughs> it was said, and rightly so, that only in Canada could you have produced such a show. You can't imagine it being produced in France or Germany. When the Fox TV news model was copied in Canada by Sun TV, it failed to draw an audience, and eventually it folded. Chalk another triumph for Canada. And we all know that the post-media group of newspapers failed to get Stephen Harper re-elected. Let's also note that the Peterborough Mosque, which was firebombed, the revulsion expressed by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau Premier Wynn and ordinary Canadians was something to behold. We can't imagine Donald Trump doing it, for example. Or Francois Hollande, the socialist turned war president of France. In 2006, no mass media in Canada reproduced the Danish cartoons. Neither the Globe, nor the Star, nor any of the major newspapers. In 2015, the Toronto Star refused to publish the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. Last fall, the media did provide great leadership and led public opinion on the issue of Syrian refugees. They exposed Mr. Harper's machinations to keep the Syrian refugees out. The Globe and Mail and CTV played a great role in it. CTV anchor Lisa Laflamme is here, and they are the ones who did the story of how the PMO was manipulating the selection of refugees. And the Toronto Star devoted its entire front page to welcoming Syrian refugees to Canada in 2015 with the message, Ahlan wa Sahlan, welcome to Canada. This was Michael Cook's doing. This was a historic page, which was reproduced all over the world. And earlier this year, Editor Cook made the decision of no longer refer to ISIS as the Islamic State, but by its name, Daesh, so that we don't implicate Islam. Let me end with some suggestions for the media. Some of the media may like it. Some of them may reject it. That is their right. I think it would be helpful for newsrooms or the industry as a whole to articulate some ethical guidelines on coverage of and commentary on Muslims. Develop a manual, maybe, that would clarify what do these following words mean? Moderate Muslims. Anti-modern Muslims. Fundamentalist Muslims. Militant Muslims and Islamist Muslims. Who exactly are these people? Who exactly are radical Muslims? Those who believe in violence, or is it something else? 
Who are these anti-modern retrograde Muslims? Is it the Muslims who don't drive cars? Don't use iPhones? Don't tweet? Don't build or visit museums? Or who refuse blood transfusions? Or is it some other state of mind that we are talking about? If so, what is it? Let's hear it. Most important, what does being linked to or associated with terrorism or jihadism really mean? Provide some specifics when making such damaging allegations about people. Don't find excuses to attribute crimes by Muslims to their religion. Use just the same standard that you use for other people and other criminals. And this is my favorite. Resist overusing the generic photos of niqab wearing women. When the story has little or nothing to do with the subject, editors love pictures of niqabi women. They leave the impression that most Muslim women wear the niqab, whereas the number who do is a tiny, tiny, tiny minority. So you may be obsessed with the message, but don't distort reality. Put public opinion and commentaries to the simple test of truth. Obviously, editors can't be theologians and Islam, but they know far less about Islam than they do about Christianity or Judaism. So consult people whom you trust, whom I know better than you. Give us a range of views. For example, the CBC commentator Rex Murphy has advanced many questionable propositions about Muslims. He's entitled to his views, of course. But where is the counter opinion on the taxpayer supported CBC? Next point to the media is extend the courtesy of listening to the complaints from Muslims. Don't be dismissive. In the case of McLean's magazine, the Muslims who went to complain came out dejected and defeated, which is what prompted them to file the complaint with the Human Rights Commissions. Exactly the same thing happened in the case of the Danish cartoons. When they went to complain to the editors of Jailand's Posten, they were totally dismissed which is in turn prompted them to take their case to the Muslim world. As the media consider these issues, I think it would be worthwhile for the newly formed National News Media Council to help foster a debate. Its president and CEO, John Fraser, is here. This council was formed last year, and it promotes professional and ethical journalistic practices including fairness of coverage and accuracy. But since the Council acts only on complaints, it would be worthwhile, I think, for some group of Muslims or non-Muslims to invite the Council to have a debate on this issue and to pronounce itself on how best to deal with this subject within the rules of fair and unbiased journalism. Similarly, I urge the other media organizations, such as the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, and Canadian Journalism Foundation, as well as Penn Canada, to hold discussions and debates. It is important to have this debate, not just for the sake of Muslims. And when we have this debate, the first thing the media will have to do is to get out of their instinctive, defensive crouch, which we usually fall into when we are criticized. We are masters at attacking everyone else, but, when, but we are far less graceful when we ourselves are put under scrutiny. It is also important to have this debate for the sake of Canada, because our pluralistic values and our harmonious model of peaceful heterogeneity are at stake. I describe myself as an incurably optimistic Canadian. So I think if any nation can debate this issue and debate it in a mature way, in a civilized way, within the framework of free speech and fair play, 
it is Canada. If we can get this thing right, we may be able to export it to the United States and Europe as well. <laughs> I think we owe it to Canada to at least give it a try. Thank you very much.